Amen. I want to welcome everyone online. We're glad that you're with us today and uh, pray that, that this will be meaningful. I love where we're at and what we're doing in walking through the Gospel of John. We've just been going verse by verse through this. Last week, we made it through the first part of, of John 15, John 16. Today, we're going to pick up uh, and, and, and where we left off and continue, continue on. Here's the setting. The setting is just a, a, a path, a short, a short road or path between the upper room and Jesus has just had Passover, instituted the Lord's Supper, had Passover with the disciples, and he's headed to the Garden of Gethsemane. In just a few hours, they're going to take him to trial, and then they're keep him up all night, and then they're going to crucify him the next day. And so in this short walk, Jesus is trying to pack everything in that he can possibly pack in to say, now guys, I'm going away, and, and, and this, I know you're sad, I know your hearts are heavy, but let me just tell you one more time, let me make sure that you get this. Listen to me, here's things that are important. You know, we we tend to listen, place emphasis on last words, don't we? We know Jesus' last words before he went to heaven. He said, he said that he was going to send the Holy Spirit to empower us, and we take hold of that. And we say, Holy Spirit, fuel the church. Well, these are last words in essence. I know there's the last words of the cross, and I know there's the last words before the ascension, but he is, he's trying to teach his last teaching moment with these guys. Now remember, in this, in this walk, he's talked to them about peace. My peace I give you, not as the world gives. How many of you are glad that God gives us a peace that passes all understanding? And how about this? How about that protecting peace? How many of you are glad that there's a lot of stuff, there's a lot of junk that never gets to me because the Holy Spirit is protecting me, and it never does even get to my mind. I'm thankful for that. I pray that. I pray that for you. And then he talks to them about being fruitful. We called it fruitful followers. How that he's the vine, we're the branches, and the branches don't bear fruit, the vine. Branches display the, the fruit. And it's sitting at the emphasis of us trying to act like we love and act like we're kind and no, when we're connected, when we are surrendered, when we are all in with the Lord, then what naturally happens is fruit, the love, the joy, the peace, the long-suffering, mercy, gentleness, goodness, faith. All these things are in us and displayed, and we're not working them up, but he's displaying them because we are connected. And, and the Bible says you'll know them by their fruit. You know when someone is real and when someone's not, why? Because we know them by their fruit. And he talked to us about being fruitful. And then, of course, he talked to us about, about love. Greatest force in all the world. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. And he talked about love and friendship and that he no longer calls us servants but calls us friends. Servant doesn't know what the master's doing. We sit at the table as friends and family with the Lord. The servants say, were outside. Now we are friends and family. Of course, we are to, to serve him with a servant's heart. But what are we? We are sons and daughters of God. We're children of God. Join heirs with Jesus Christ. Isn't that awesome? But we, we also recognize the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life. So servant's heart. But not only did he talk about love and how to deal with, with the world, he talked to us about hate and about our enemy. And that there's an enemy who hates us. He said, he said they hated me and they're going to hate you. And I will tell you, it's no different today. There is a world that hates me hates everything I stand for, and thinks it's absolutely asinine and absurd what I'm talking about and preaching today. They look at me with disdain. And any 
child of God that follows the biblical pattern. Why do they hate us? The world hates us. The world hates, hates me, hates the church because we believe in creation. Because we believe in the sanctity of life. Because we believe that there's two genders, male, female, and that a man and a woman get married. Sanctity of marriage. Because we believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus said, don't be surprised when they hate you. They hated me. But then he taught us how to engage the world. And you don't, you don't impact the world by acting like the world. Hello? There's something that was attractive about Jesus. There was something that drew so many. God, help the love of God. Help the fruit of the Spirit to be displayed because I'm so connected with my Father. Amen. That it impacts, that it influences, that it changes the dynamic of the room, of the, of the home, of the community. Because we actually live this thing out and we're not acting it out. Amen. So, so he teaches us about love and friends and hate and enemies. Then here's where he picks up. Here's the next section in John, John 15. But when the helper comes, whom I will send you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he's offering a service to God. How warped can thinking be? But that's exactly what they did to Jesus. It's what they did to the disciples. That same disdain for those who stand in line with God's word today. And they will do these things, and they do these things because they have not known the Father or me. But I've said these things to you that when their hour comes, that when the, when the hour comes, you may remember that I told you. I did not say these things to, to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now I'm going to him who sent me. And none of you ask, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrows filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send to you, I will send him to you, and when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. That's what we're emphasizing today. Grab hold of that. He says he will, that the Spirit will convict the world Concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin because they do not believe me. Concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. And concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I've said, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you in all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So we're looking at, at, at the unction of the Holy Spirit, which is the power and the dynamic that was poured out on the day of Pentecost, that was evidenced when Peter preached under the anointing of the Holy Spirit and 3,000 people were saved. We, we understand the unction, the power, the dunamis. We're also looking at the function. What Jesus is saying, here's what the Holy Spirit's gonna do. Here's the function of the Holy Spirit. Here's, the, if you will, the, the job description of the Holy Spirit. You know, for many, the, the Holy Spirit is is it's not emphasized, it's, it's, not, it's not studied as much. In some people, it's, it's almost like a mystery. But it shouldn't be. We are Trinitarians. We're part of our doctrinal statement, our foundation, is we believe in the Trinity, the Father, God the Father. Can you say it with me? God the Father, God the Son, 
and God the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. He is co-equal and co-eternal with God the Father and God the Son. You see it all through Scripture. He's referred to in old languages as the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, Spirit of Jesus, Spirit of Jesus Christ, Spirit of the Lord, Spirit of the living God, eternal Spirit, the Spirit of life, the Spirit of your Father, the Spirit of the Son, or just the Spirit. He told his disciples, he said, it's better that I go away. What's better than having Jesus? He said, having the Holy Spirit. It's better because Jesus is one place at one time. The Holy Spirit is everywhere. So greater works than these shall you do. Not that they're greater than the Lord's works, but there's greater in number because the Holy Spirit is everywhere. And we're able to see God work all around this world. So it's better that I go away. And he sent us the Holy Spirit. Now, we talked a little bit last week about the Holy Spirit shows us what is wrong, and we, we emphasize sin. When the Holy Spirit comes, he'll convict the world concerning sin, sin because they do not believe in me. So, we talked about the Holy Spirit convicts lost people of unbelief, and the Holy Spirit convicts believers to obey. This morning, now, let's jump to the second thing. I want you to grab a hold of. The Holy Spirit shows us, convicts us, convicts the world of righteousness. The Holy Spirit shows us what is righteous. John 16 and verse 10, it says this, concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. When we talk about righteousness, we're not talking simply about right decisions or about just doing good, but what we're talking about is being in right standing with God. Jesus was the standard. He was the standard. So now he's leaving. What does the Bible say, John 16, 10? Because I go to the Father. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, you'll see me no more. So who's going to convict the world? Who's going to convict all of us of righteous, being right standing with God? It's the Holy Spirit. So that's a good work of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank God he brings conviction. Thank God he convicts me because I get off track, and his conviction is his love to get me back on track. I need his conviction. It's a good thing. And so the Holy Spirit, he convicts us of righteousness. Jesus was the standard. So who's going to convict us if Jesus is gone? Well, he gives us the Holy Spirit. When it comes to righteousness, I think that's another area of of the Christ-following life that we get confused on. Because as human beings, I don't know if we totally grasp or believe what the Bible has to say concerning what righteousness is. We struggle with this just as being humans, and and it's this idea that we think we know what is right. We think we know what is right. If you ask the average person, how how are you going to, how do you get to heaven? They're going to say by being good and by doing good. If my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds, then maybe there's some kind of hope for me. And so we relate, we relate righteousness to works the same way we relate grace. For by grace you are saved. It's the gift of God. It is not of yourself. But we have a hard time. We think, I got to do something. I got to go to church. I got to read my Bible. I got to do this. I got to do this. I got to do this. And then God will be happy with me. No. Then I can go to heaven. No. For by grace you're saved. All right. We do the same thing with righteousness. I gotta, I've got to be righteous. I've got I've to make right decisions. I've got to do all these things. We can't. We can't do it. I can't. People say, well, I'd be a Christian, but I just can't live it. Right. Me neither. 
That's why I need God. That's why I need Jesus. That's why I need the Holy Spirit working in my life. It's amazing how how we allow our pride and our arrogance to blind us to the power of the gospel and the power of the Spirit. Same way that Satan allowed pride and arrogance to cause him to be cast from heaven. It's something we gravitate towards. We think we're something. We think we're better than we are. No. We all need his righteousness in our lives. The Bible says this, Proverbs 14, 12, there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end, its end is the way of death. And how many people think they're on the right road only to discover that they were doing what they wanted to do. They were following their ideas rather than saying, I surrender. Jesus, be Lord of my life. Big difference, right? So we think we, we think we know what's right. A lot of people think they'll get to heaven just doing good. Here's the second thought on righteousness. The Holy Spirit convicts us. The Holy Spirit shows us and offers us his or Christ's righteousness. There was an exchange that took place. When Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, what was happening was he took all of my sin, all of my condemnation, my guilt, the filth, the junk. He took the whole world, the darkest deeds, the most devilish deeds. He took it all on himself, and he said this. He said, I'll take your sin and myself on the cross, and here's what I give you. I'm going to take your anger, your bitterness, your hate, your junk, and I'll give you love, joy, and peace. I'll give you life. I will give you righteousness. I'll take your self-righteousness as his filthy rags, and I'll give you my righteousness. Man, what, a, what an offer. Isn't the gospel the best news in all the world? He takes my junk and gives me all of his good. He offers us his righteousness. Let me ask you a question. How many in this room are righteous? Hold your hand up. All right, let me ask you a second question. How many of you are going, you're going to heaven? You're headed to heaven. Lift your hand up. All right, we got a problem. And here's the problem. Only righteous people are going to heaven. So everyone who didn't lift their hand on the first one, come down and let's get right with God. Now, I know that's a little bit of a trick question, but do you see the point I'm making? See, you've got to start seeing yourself as the righteousness of God in Christ. What we're shying away from is uh, what Isaiah talks about, our self-righteousness. And it stinks to God, all of our efforts to try to be good enough. But we receive his righteousness. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21 says, For our sake... He made him to be sin who knew no sin. He knew no sin. He had never sinned. He didn't know what it was like to feel condemnation and guilt. He'd never sinned. Pure. And all this filth was dumped upon him. And Isaiah said, he, in the old language, it says he was uncomely, which means he didn't even look like a man. Oh, he was brutalized on the cross. He was beaten. Crown of thorns. All these things that took place. The night before in the garden, he sweat as though great, great drops of blood. I'm sure facing the physical helmet would make your skin crawl. But it wasn't so much the physical. That was the sacrifice. But what, what he was facing was something he never knew. And that was sin. And it caused him to even lose the disfigured my sin your sin everyone's sin for our sake 
for my sake, for your sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. Why? So that we could make that exchange so that I could become the righteousness of God in Christ. Say it with me. So that I could become the righteousness of God in Christ. Declare it. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. See, that's not of your works. Your works, your works stink to God. It's his righteousness, his righteousness, his righteousness. And that's what he offers us. Isn't that the best news? That's the best thing I know anything about. Amen? Now think about this. The devil's the accuser of the brethren. He's always telling God how no good we are, how, how, how much of a hypocrite I am, and how, how uh, I fall and I fail, and can't believe that you let him pastor a church, can't believe you let him do anything. And he's constantly accusing. But Jesus steps in. He intercepts what the enemy's doing. He intercedes. The Bible says he ever lives to make intercession. He intercedes, he intercepts, and he says, hold it, Father. Fred has accepted me. He's confessed with his mouth the Lord Jesus. He believes in his heart. God raised Jesus from the dead. I want you to see Fred through me. He's righteous. He's got my righteousness. Amen? The devil will always try to accuse, always try to push you down. You've got to remember something. You know Jesus Christ. You've confessed him as Lord. There's not saved, saved, or saved us. Either you is or you ain't. Hello? So what's the deal? I am the righteousness of God. He sees me through the white robes of righteousness. He sees me righteous. I can't do that. What good news that is. I love that. Okay, here's the next thing I want you to, to grab a hold of. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit shows us what's coming. What's coming? Judgment. Judgment. We don't think of the Holy Spirit in light of judgment, but that's exactly what the Bible tells us. It says in John 16, 11, Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judge. The Holy Spirit has come to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Then it gives a definition for each. And concerning judgment, concerning judgment, because the ruler of the world has been judged. The Bible says this. It says that every one of us in this room are going to die. The Bible says, tells us, Hebrews 9, 27, and just as it is appointed for man to die once, after that comes the judgment. We may come from different regions of the world, we, uh, we, different socioeconomic backgrounds, different nationalities, there may be all kinds of differences that we have in this room, but there is one common factor among us, and it's this. Everyone in this room, outside of the fact Jesus Christ coming back to rapture us, everyone in this room will face death. It's appointed, and I don't know when my time is. I don't know when my date is, but I have a date. I'd like to change it, move it back, but I have a date. And then the Bible says, after death comes the judgment. So what, what, are, what are the judgment? What are we talking about? Well, there's two aspects. First of all is this, is Satan has been tried, judged, and condemned. Satan has been tried, judged, and condemned. Concerning Satan, here's what happens. Sometimes, sometimes we give the devil all kinds of of credit, and sometimes we give him too much credit or too much due. Sometimes we focus too much on him, but Jesus had things to say about the enemy. We need to see it. Remember this. The devil is not some lesser God. He's not the dark force. He is a fallen angel. 
And when pride entered and he rose up against God and he was cast out of heaven, he fell further and further and down and down and down. And what's happening in the world is not some cosmic battle that is still up for grabs and we're hoping we win by a last second field goal. No, the score has already been posted. The devil is a defeated foe. He knows it. He has been tried, judged, and condemned, and he's just waiting on his sentence to be enacted. Remember that. Understand that. The Bible says this, Revelation 20.10, and the devil who had deceived him was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophets were, and they will be tormented day and night forever. So, so there's a judgment. Now, we also know this, that all people are going to be judged. And they're going to be judged on how they respond, on how they respond to the Lord. So, for those who don't say yes, the Holy Spirit knocks on their heart. Those who reject the Lord will face a judgment of condemnation. This isn't about, this isn't about being... <laughs> This is walking through the Bible verse by verse. These are things Jesus is talking to his disciples, but right before, hours before he goes to the cross. I think he's wanting to get something across to them. Some people say, well, this is just an old-fashioned sermon. No, this is as relevant as anything. It's in your Bible. If you read devotionally, you'll come across it eventually. And he's, and he's saying that there's a judgment and that those that don't receive Christ are going to face that judgment. Revelation 20 and verse 15, and if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown in the lake of fire. That's not, that's not the church being mean. That's not even God being mean. God created hell for, for Satan and for all of his imps. Our decisions in this world affect eternity. This message, what, you know what it does for me? It says, God, help me to be more spiritually sensitive, more spiritually aware, because there's lost people all around me who are lost and headed for an eternity away from you. Jesus, let me be salt and light in this earth. Amen. Use me. And then, of course, we know this, that when we know the Lord, we will stand at the Bema Seat judgment, which is like an Olympic stand. And that judgment is literally a reward ceremony where we'll be rewarded for our works here on earth. So we're not judged according to sin as, as Christ's followers, but, but it's this award ceremony. It's not condemnation, but it's condemn, condemnation. It's, a, it's an encouragement for us. It's a victory for us we get to that point. Amen? I got to wind this up. So there's a judgment, and, that's, and the Holy Spirit convicts us of that. How about this? The Holy Spirit shows us what to do, and that is this, glorify Jesus. What do we say as, as a church, the island church, giving glory to God on this island? Let me ask you about your life. Does your life give glory to God, or does your life give glory to yourself? This church isn't about me. I recognize that. I recognize I'm privileged to do what I do, but I also know that if I, if I don't want to do it and I choose to go a different direction, that God has someone else that would step in. He doesn't have to have me here. You know that? I'm just grateful he allows me. So I, that helps me remember this thing isn't all about me. It's all about him. It's his kingdom come, his will be done. It's not my kingdom, my, my will, it's his. So does my life, am I like John the Baptist, do I step out of the limelight and say, I must decrease, he must increase? 
This has got to be about Jesus. I hide myself in the cross. More Jesus, more of you, Lord, more Holy Spirit in our life. Let me, let me close by going back to that first point. The Holy Spirit shows us what is right and wrong. He convicts us if we're unbelievers. Thank God. How many remember when the Holy Spirit tugged at your heart and you gave your life to Christ? Thankful for the Holy Spirit tugging at your heart. And then he guides us. There's two passages that I want us to, to just think about. It's the First Thessalonians 5, 12 through 22 passage. And in the midst of, of all these things where he says, you know, don't repay evil with evil. Always seek to do good to one another, to everyone. Rejoice. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. Be at peace with one another. In the midst of all that, he says, do not quench the spirit. Do not quench the spirit. What quenches the spirit? Well, do we, do we encourage the weak? It says up here, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak. Are we patient with people? Are we, are we, are we revenge? Are we revenge people? We're not getting even, we're getting back. It's gonna be worse. Do we give thanks? Do we hold fast what is good? Do we abstain from every kind of evil? Those are the things that quench the Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit's come to do a work in us, to be our comforter, to be our guide. And then the Lord speaks real directly to help us concerning sin, concerning righteousness, and concerning judgment. The Holy Spirit does a wonderful, he empowers us. And I think about this, I think, how come the church is not more spirit-led? How come there's not more of a surrender? How come there's not more fruit in our life? How come we're not making a bigger impact? And it's maybe because we're quenching the spirit. Because we're still doing what we want to do. We're going we're gonna to let people know what we think. We're going to lead. We're going to be in charge. And we're going to run over whoever gets in our way to get it done. Because that's the American way. Pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. My way or the highway, let's, let's go. There's no, Lord, what are, you, what are you speaking? How can I follow you? How can I display? How can I show what you're like? That's not weakness. That takes all the strength in the world to crucify the flesh, to live righteous, to live empowered. Amen? What about Ephesians 4, 22 through 32? In the midst of all this, put off your, your old self, be renewed in your mind. Get true righteousness, true righteousness. Quit lying, falsehood, speak truth. Don't be angry, not letting the sun go on your wrath. Don't give the devil any opportunity. Don't let corrupt communication, don't let corrupt talk come out of your mouth. Don't grieve the spirit. Grieve the spirit. Up above, quench the spirit. Here, grieve the spirit. By our bitterness, are you a bitter person? Are you still hanging on to that past hurt that something happened to you 10 years ago and you just can't get over it? It happens all the time. All the time. Well, this happened and now, you know, do you know, do you know that that God's powerful? And do you know that God changes life? And do you know that God can explode you out of your past and that he has a great present and future for you and you don't have to live in that, in that, in that ditch? <laughs> Aren't you glad? Anybody used to be really bitter, but God got you out of it? Give a testimony? Yeah. Get all bitterness and anger, wrath, all that evil speaking. And this week, I, I was just thinking, I was thinking, okay, in service and online, we'll probably have about a thousand folks with us today. What would happen in this community if a thousand people entered this, this community 
saying, I'm going to walk surrendered to the Holy Spirit. I'm listening. You guide me. I'm going to show acts of kindness. I'm going to love people. I'm going to forgive people. I'm going to encourage people. I'm not going to backbite. I'm not going to bellyache. I'm not going to gossip. And I'm not going to gossip in prayer requests in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm not going to do all the same. I'm not going to get on Facebook and make my points and do all my things. How, what would happen in our community if we actually live spirit-led lives? Don't you believe there would be a revival in our, in our homes and in our town? That's the kind of exponential impact spirit-led spirit -led living could make if we just surrendered to the Holy Spirit instead of thinking, we got a market on it. We know what to do. We're in charge. Best life in all the world. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And he'll take care of you. He'll put you where you need to be. Oh, how I need the Holy Spirit. I can't live this life without it. Oh, how I need the Holy Spirit. Anybody, amen? Fill us. Can you just ask the Lord, fill me with your spirit? Can we pray that right now? Holy Spirit. I need you. Convict me. Show me sin and, and, and righteousness, that it's not self-righteousness. Show me where I walk in self-righteousness and where I'm trying to do works. God, I lean toward it. I, I have this performance mentality and this competitive nature. And so, God, I, I'm always trying to be good enough. I can't be good enough. I need you, Lord. Concerning judgment, Lord, that there are people lost, use me. And then that I might literally display the fruit of God. That I won't be acting like the enemy. The enemy wants to undermine and kill and steal and destroy. Wreck people's reputation and try to make others look bad to lift themselves up. God, forgive us. And help us, help us to look more like you. Your DNA, that's your DNA in us. I love you, Lord. I just want to say, church, I want to tell you publicly. I want you to hear this. I want God to hear it. I want you to declare it. I love you, Lord, and I need you, Holy Spirit, to be big in my life. Therefore, I will not live every day void of that. Be not drunk with wine where it's dissipation, but I will, I will seek to be continually filled. I'll open my life to be continually filled with your Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together. Let's stand together. Liz, join me, would you please? With our heads bowed and eyes closed, let me ask you a question. Is there anybody here today you say, the Holy Spirit's tugging at my heart. Maybe you're at home, sitting, sitting on your couch, or maybe you're driving down a freeway or an interstate. You're listening. Wherever you're at, is the Holy Spirit tugging at your heart? That's God's gracious love and goodness. He says this, he says that in while we were yet sinners that Christ died for us. He tells us that all have sinned, all have sinned, every one of us. Everyone's a sinner. Just some sinners have been forgiven and some sinners are lost. So all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But he also tells us this, that if we'll confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, we'll be saved. Is there anyone today you say, Pastor, pray for me when you close in prayer this morning. I want to surrender my life. He's knocking at my heart. See, and I believe this, God gives us grace even to surrender, grace to say yes. If that's you, hold your hand up high. Pastor, pray for me when you dismissed today. Thank you. 
Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Is there others? That's me, Pastor. God's over here, thank you. Anyone else? Listen, it's not a magical prayer. I'm just trying to help us to pray from our heart and follow that scriptural pattern of what he says. We had a number of hands that were lifted. Can I ask everyone in the, in, in, in the auditorium today, would you pray this out loud just to help those that are praying it to make that first time commitment or that rededication? Can you all just pray this out loud? Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me and for the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Yes, come into my life, forgive me of my sins. I believe Jesus is the Son of God, and he died on the cross for my sins. And I believe by the power of God, he rose from the dead. Be my Savior and Lord, and help me to live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow, is that not awesome? Yeah, I love it. <laughs> listen, 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 listen. You can't do it by yourself. Every day, Holy Spirit, fill me, help me to live for you. Help me today to display. I don't create fruit. I'm not working this up. Let me just be a person who displays what you're doing inside of me. Because the Bible says they'll know you by your fruit. So, Lord, let your fruit. Amen. I love this. Please text this number. Please, please write it down. Please text that. I would love to hear from you, and I would love to respond. And if you'll text the word next to the number on the screen here in the auditorium or at home, the number on your screen at home, we'll be in touch with you. Greatest decision you'll ever make in your life is this moment of surrender. A lot of religious people know a whole lot about God but don't have any victory. We're talking about being spirit, spirit-led because we let the Spirit fill us. Amen. Amen. Hey, I love you. I love you. I love what God's doing. How many today, you say, Pastor, God spoke something to my heart. I really needed this message today. Would you lift your hand, anybody? Boy, I did. Thank you. Let's practice it. Let's practice when we walk through those doors what a blood-bought, spirit-filled follower of Christ ought to, ought to display to a lost world. Amen. God, fill us and use us is my prayer. Can we clap our hands and give God a shout of praise? Just say, thank you, Lord. Bless your name, Lord. I'm so glad you joined us today as we continue our study in the book of John. If you sense God working in your heart and are contemplating the claims of Christ, or maybe you've prayed with me at the end, we would love to connect with you. Simply text the word NEXT to 251-244-2030 and tell us how we can be praying for you. If you're watching for the first time, head to our website, theislandchurch.tv and click connect. You can also submit a prayer request right there on the homepage. And you can also give toward the work of this ministry by clicking give. God is doing a good work here and the Island Church is blessed. Thank you for joining us today. I pray good for you as you seek the Lord and walk with Him. Have an awesome day and the best is yet to come.